Hey guys, welcome to another exciting and disgusting episode of Nightmare Road. I am one of your hosts, Deacon, and I'm here with the very mysterious SOS. I whispered it too. SOS. More mysterious. <laughs> and uh, as a disclaimer here, guys, if um, you guys have a weak stomach or you guys get triggered easily, May I suggest you go and watch the Royal Lizard People Wedding or whatever is going on out there. So, um, yeah, so let's not get triggered. Let's not, you know, you don't have to listen. So it, this show gets gory, gets bad. So there you go. That's your last warning. Yep. We 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 look um, We look like we're pleasant people, but we really do like gore. So what can I say? Anyway. I don't, I, I don't look pleasant. One. You don't like gore? No, I said I don't look pleasant. I look like I've been dead for four years. Well, that's true. You do look like you could probably take somebody out. Where I'm sitting in my kitchen and I look, you know, like Betty Home Crocker sitting here. But anyway. <laughs> uh, it's because my basement that's all decorated for the podcast is so cold that I'm like, I can't. I just can't. I can't go down there right now. It's just too cold. So, um. So we have a good one for you. Um, we're going to talk about a guy named John Hay from Stamford, Lincolnshire. And let's see, that's it. Well, it's in England, obviously. West, let's see. I, I don't know. I don't I don't get the whole like English townships, counties, all that kind of thing. Um, it's very confusing to me. He was raised in a village called Outwood, which is West Riding of Yorkshire. Whatever. I, I don't know what that means. Anyway. Yeah. That was my attempt. Uh, that was terrible. Yeah, I can't do an English accent to save my life. My dad could. Uh, especially when he was drinking whiskey. <clears throat> so his parents were um, an engineer named John Hay, and his wife was Emily, Emily Hay, or... Hudson was her maiden name. And they were members of a very strict conservative Protestant sect called the Plymouth Brethren. Oh. And yeah, so, you know, when we get into, and, and many times these murders that I'm researching, when we get into people who are super devout, very, very strict, I don't know what it is, but a, a lot... <laughs> It's like a lot of the murders that I'm researching also have a very devout strain of religion to them. And I, I don't know where that comes from. Um, I, I, I just don't, I don't know. I don't know if, you know, there's, there's a, there seems to be an association between families that have kids that snap and they're super devout, and very, very strict with their kids. And they have no, like no freedom whatsoever, those kids. And uh, I'm not saying that every kid that de that's in a devout home will snap, but a, a lot of the murders that are researched are from very devout homes. Yeah, there's got to be some wires crossed in that family. Like, otherwise, you know, I think that sects of that kind, like, really attract the people that are slightly unhinged and maybe they're better at it, at hiding it. And then the kids are maybe not as good as I, then they just snap. Or, I don't know, it's it's a whole weird thing. It's kind of like, so, there's a, what was that guy's name? Doctor, was it Doctor Stevens? He's talking about serial killers and how people think, like, is there more serial killers now? And it's like, no, there's just more prey out there. There's more victims, just more people. So And publicity. And I yeah. mean, before... Well, look at the ones that we did early on in, in this podcast, right? You had Texas and Louisiana, the axe murderers that were going on basically from neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood, but there was no communication between police precincts. So it's harder to catch people. Yeah. Now, yeah. you know, it's everywhere. I mean, if something happens, every all the police forces are alerted. So anyway, they were... An affluent family who attended a, like classical music concerts. They were they were they were educated people. Um, they, they were um, 
What? The classical music? Oh, one? it's a classical music. It's kind of like the people that like the bagpipes, and then they're like, oh, I just love the bagpipes, or whatever it is. And I, and I used to tell them, I'm like, well, I could find the world's best bagpipe player and put them right here. And then take the world's worst bagpipe player and put them right here, and you won't be able to tell the difference. I cannot believe you said that. I love the pipes. <laughs> so you you are one of those weirdos. Not number mind. See, I quit the show. I love the pipes. Anyway, I've heard a lot of people like, yeah. like I think that's why I love the pipes. You know. Wow. Um. So they. This this guy was also, let's see, he attended the Queen Elizabeth Grammar School in Wakefield Cathedral in Wakefield in England. He um he he received scholarships, he was educated. I mean, he had everything going for him. He had everything going for him. Upper affluent family, you know. Um but he started suffering from reoccurring religious nightmares in his childhood. That's not good. Um, so I I don't know what that, you know, psychologically, I don't know what that's all about. But reoccurring religious nightmares specifically is what it said, not reoccurring nightmares. So it sounds to me like mm, that really devout uh, um, Protestant sect was messing with him. He did yeah, or, uh, play the piano. Huh? What do they call that? There's a... Uh... It's called like religious psychosis where somebody gets like involved with a religion and they take it to the very extreme. And in the 1960s, they believed that it was the the religious aspect of it. So then they're like, well, this person, you know, he's really devoted this. And then when that person changed religion, it it turned him, you know, the same way, only with a different religion. And then they realized that these people if you make them join a type of club like whether it be a gun club a golf club or whatever you know whatever those are called that those people become like very like devout to that thing it's almost like an obsessive thing to be an obsession to belong to a group to the point where it's extreme and develops into psychosis or they're already psychotic and then this just you know that's actually really interesting thinking back and some of the some of the things in my life where I, where I've seen that, you know, uh, different groups that I'm involved with locally. And, and you see these like hanger honors, like they can't, yeah. you know what I mean? Like they're, yeah. they can't, yeah, they can't shake them. It's weird. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Those people could be, could be uh, murderers. You never know. <laughs> I know. Right. I'm like, no, go away. So he developed, he did play the piano. He had a fondness for music. So he had everything going for him. He, after school, he apprenticed uh, in a firm of, they call it motor engineers. So I don't know if that means he was like an auto, uh, like an auto, uh, automobile engineer. I don't know what that means specifically. Let's see. Engineer or something. Yeah, maybe. Let's see. This is 19... This is in the 1930s, so he could have been. Oh, okay, yeah. After, yeah. After a year, he left that job, and then he took jobs in insurance and advertising. At age 21, he was dismissed from his job, which is a polite way in English tone of being fired. Yeah, he got fired. Being, yeah, after being suspected of stealing from a cash box. Um, then he took a sharp left turn and started forging car documents. So he went from being an engineer to being a forger. Ah, pretty interesting. So it's a good business. I guess so. I guess, you know, if you're forging paintings or forging whatever, uh, I'm not clever enough and I have a bad guilty conscience. So. I oh like yeah. I mean, you gotta be a real scumbag, but. Yeah, I can do it. Huh, I lose sleep over little little things that I say, like in the people. You know what I mean? I couldn't. I couldn't. You know. Okay. On July 6, nineteen thirty-four, Hay married twenty-three-year-old Beatrice Betty. Is the, how she went by Hammer. Little the Mary. marriage. Oh, Betty Beatrice. Uh, the marriage soon disintegrated because. That year, he was jailed for fraud. 
Go figure. Whoa, so, no way. Yeah, no way. Betty gave birth while he was in prison, poor girl, and she placed Ooh. the baby for adoption and left Hay while he was in jail. And this led Hay's family, John's family, to ostracize him from the family. They were so upset. I mean, here they are, an affluent family, uh, educated, skilled, you know, upper crust family, and he's doing all of this stuff. So they left. They that's it. You're out of the family. <sighs> so this is where things get dark. So I, I really quick before we get there, I just pictured the family all standing in line as he walks in. They all smack him with a white glove. Ostracized. That's it. <laughs> uh, so he's released from prison in 1936 because he remember he 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 didn't he had he didn't have a, a long stint in prison. So I guess it looks like about two years, maybe a year and a half. He's released from prison and he becomes a chauffeur. And. He's chauffeur to a guy, to uh, William McSwain. And, and William was a really wealthy owner of Amusement Arcades, which was a big deal in the 30s. And mm. so he's making a lot of money off these arcades over in England. And he maintained uh, McSwain's amusement machines. So I, I'm, I don't know exactly what machines, but I'm assuming like the carousel and all the, these different amusement things. So he's his driver, he's his mechanic, he's his handyman. And then he decides to pretend to be a solicitor, uh, a lawyer named William Cato Admonson. He even had a mil middle name. Yeah, what an idiot. <laughs> And Cato, do you remember that name, Cato? Yes, I remember that that name, Cato. <laughs> yeah. the, the Green Hornet. So it's like Kate, William Cato Abinson. So he's pretending to be a lawyer, and he has fake offices on Chancery Lane in London, Guildford, Surrey, Hastings, and Sussex. So I guess on his letterhead, he has all of this stuff. All these so, titles. Well, if you had could have any... See, now I'm, I'm taken away from the darkness here, because I'm very sleepy and i'm over here my mind's just going so if you what would your english accent be i have the most ridiculous thing in my head right now what would mine be yeah like i can't do english i can do irish because my dad my grandfather spoke gaelic so i don't know i i, I guess that with me if i had like a british accent it would just be like mostly sounds and then like one word <laughs> In between sounds, I'd be like, Cheerio. 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 So, what is he doing? Kind of sounded like a horse snicker there for a second, so. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Wasn't there a cartoon that had that on there? Just sounds and then Cheerio? I don't know. It was like Warner Brothers way back in the day. Oh, wow. I'm not I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah, well, I am. So he sold I am. He sold fraudulent stock shares Ooh. reportedly from the estates of his deceased clients. So he would get clients as a, this fake lawyer. Right? And I know. So I don't know. It sounds to me like what he was doing was he was finding people who were probably just died and he'd swoop in and pretend to be their lawyer if they didn't yeah. have one. Like the total ambulance chaser, right? So he swoops in, yeah. says that he's their solicitor, and then he's selling off all their stuff and he has no legal claim to do so. Yeah. yeah by the time he's they realize that, that he's, the, yeah, by the time they realize they've been swindled, he's gone. Well, yeah. So his scam was uncovered um, by someone who noticed he misspelled Guilford, G-U-I-L-D-F-O-R-D, as Guilford without the D on his letterhead. I have no idea why that's who, a big deal, but it is. Who, who was it, Sherlock Holmes? Wait a I minute! Know, right? Wait. So he goes back to prison. So now he's in prison on a four-year sentence 
for fraud again. So this sounds like, you know, okay, he's just a fraudster, but wait, <laughs> just wait. After Hay was released, he was released this time after the Second World War. He continued as a fraudster and was sentenced several further terms of imprisonment. So they put him in prison for just a few uh, years here and there, and then he'd get out and he'd do something else nefarious, and they'd put him back. So this guy just couldn't stay clean. There was just no way. He's, he doesn't have it in his nature. But now he's regretting that he left his victims alive to finger him. Yes. So he's like, you know, they're, they're pointing their finger at me yeah. and saying, I'm the one who's doing all this stuff. So he decides, wow, if I kill him, uh, problem solved. <laughs> yeah, with a fake mustache. <laughs> right. So he he becomes intrigued by this French murderer named, um, I think it's Jorge Alexandra Serret, who had disposed of his bodies using sulfuric acid. So he starts reading everything he can on this French guy, right? Um, so Hay started, and this is gross. So if you have a weak stomach, like any, you, you can't listen to our podcast, but anyway. He starts experimenting with field mice and putting them in sulfuric acid. And he found that it took only 30 minutes for a field mouse to completely dissolve. Now, gross. Um, so this time, in 1943, when he's released from prison again, he becomes an accountant with an engineering firm. Uh, by chance, he bumped into his fur, his old employer, the William McSwain, who had the amusements, um, in a pub in Kensington. So McSwain introduced Hay to his parents, to um, McSwain's parents, Donald and Amy. McSwain worked for them by collecting rents on their London properties. So these people were very affluent, and they had a lot of properties. So he became he becomes the guy that goes door to door to get all the rents, but. He's envious of their lifestyle because they're very, very well off. So on 6 September 1944, McSwain, William, disappears. He's gone. Nobody can find him. Uh, later, Hay will admit that he lured McSwain to a basement on um, Gloucester Road, hit him over the head with a lead pipe, and then put his body in a 40 gallon drum with concentrated sulfuric acid. Ooh. So, Ooh. two days later, he found that McSwain's body had mostly dissolved, so he emptied the drum into a manhole. Right? So, which probably is going right into a river, because yeah. whatever. But yeah. anyway, so he's thinking, wow, this is cool. Now I've committed the perfect crime, because I, there's no body. There's no body. So, so he told McSwain's parents, this um, um, Donald and Amy, that their son had gone into hiding in Scotland to avoid being called up for military service. Um, they bought it for a time, and Hay moves into McSwain's house and started collecting rent for, and he's still collecting rent for McSwain's parents. So he's a really good con man. Yeah, I was going to say, like, man, this guy, if you would have, put that genius to work on something positive right yeah he probably would have cured cancer right <clears throat> but the war ends and their son never comes home so they're they're like well we're easy because he never received like the death notice or anything like that so he figures well i gotta do something about this so on july 2nd 1945 he lures them to the residence by telling them that their so, son was back from Scotland. I know. Um, that yeah, so he says William's home for a surprise visit. And you guys come on over and we're gonna, you know, have dinner. We're gonna have a little shindig. So he kills them with blows to the head, and then he disposes of them um in acid, and then he's stealing their pension checks that are coming in. And he sold uh Donald and Amy's properties. So as he's now he's the solicitor again and he's selling their properties and collecting all this money. 
And then he moves into the Onslow Court Hotel in Ken Kensington. I guess that's kind of a fancy place. He's got all this money. Everybody thinks he's well-to-do. And in the meantime, he's murdering people and dumping them in acid and taking their property and selling it. It's crazy that nobody's caught on yet. But he has a problem. He was a gambler. So in 1947, oh, of course. yep, he's running short of money due to his gambling debts. And to solve his financial problems, he finds another couple to kill and rob um, called um, Archibald Henderson and his wife, Rose. He pretends to be a real estate buyer and expressed interest in a house they were selling. Okay. So the Hendersons invited him over to the house. And while at the house, he stole Archibald's revolver. I guess he found it somewhere. And then he planned to use it in his next crime. Um, so he rents a small little workshop in Crawley, West Sussex, and he moves the acid and the drums from Gloucester Road to West Sussex. And this proves to be his downfall, actually. Because remember how he was getting rid of the acid? Yeah. And he was dumping it down manholes, right? Well, this new building that he rented doesn't have manholes. So he just, uh-oh, he didn't think about that. So on, on 1948, February 12th, he drove Archibald Henderson to his new workshop, telling him that he had an invention that he created. And when they arrived, Hayes shot Henderson with his own gun in the head. And then he lures Rose Henderson, um, Archibald's wife, to the workshop, claiming that her husband had fallen ill. So she gets there and he shoots her as well into the drums they go. Oh, okay. man, I didn't think he was going to use a revolver. I thought that he was going to lure them and be like, I have, an, I have a new invention. It's called the Unaliver. And he, like, hits him in the head with a lead <laughs> pipe. So he he forges a letter with their signatures and sold all their possessions except for their car and their dog, which he kept. Right? So now he's got five murders. And... um. He has this rented warehouse and he's um, broke again from gambling debts and he needs to find another wealthy victim. So now he's pretending to be an engineer again. So he's gone from engineer to accountant to amusement park guy to driver, chauffeur. I mean, he's just bouncing all around, solicitor. So he's an engineer this time and he meets a wealthy widow named Olive Durand Deacon. That sounds very upper crust. Oh, um, proper. Very proper. So she's age 69 and she wants to hire Hay because he's an engineer. And she has, now this gal is on it. She has an invention. She invented fake fingernails. Can you believe oh. that? This is, yeah, way back then she she wants him to design these artificial fingernails. So this gal's sharp. She's like, okay, this will make some money. So he's like, okay, she's rich and she has this design. So <laughs> he asked her, poor Olive, to meet her at his warehouse so they could go over and, and work out the design and how to manufacture the design of the fake fingertips, right? Oh, the fake man. fingernails. He's like, oh, well, stop inventions. So I'll show you my unaliver. Uh, the unaliver is struck again because he shot her in the back of the neck with the 38 and that he had stole from Archibald. So he still has that gun. He stripped her of her valuables, including her lamb coat. She had a Parisian lamb coat on Ooh. and put her in the acid bath. So uh. there she goes. Two days later, const, um, uh, Duran Deacon's friend named Constant Lane reports her missing. She's like, she's always here. They probably always had tea together. I mean, she's like, she's gone. But this time he slipped up because um, remember he had the warehouse with no drains and he didn't know how to get rid of the drums. So he's got three bodies and drums and he doesn't know how to get rid of them. So he, um, he was trying to dispose of the drums behind a building and Yes. And so people had seen him do that. And at the same time, people remember Hay remeeting with or meeting with this guy with the olive because they met, I think, in like a bar of a hotel 
And so people, he'd lived in the hotel, so they knew who he was. So they're like, well, she had a meeting with this guy, John. And uh, so they were starting to put two and two together. Like, well, the last person to see her was John. So they go over to his, they discover his workshop and they find this briefcase that he kept with all of this forged documents. So now they're, they're like, wow, this dude is really bad news. And he had kept like, oh, and then he took Olive's coat in and had it dry cleaned. So that's, yeah. So they were able to like, yeah, you have her coat. I guess it was a very expensive coat. So anyway, and then he also had papers that he had forged the bill of sale for the Hendersons, all of their property. So anyway, he's pinned with all of this stuff. Um, he, he's trying to pour the, the, the remains out behind the building and, and the investigation of the area by pathologist Keith Simpson revealed 28 pounds of human body fat, part of a human foot, human gallstones. I guess that's weird <laughs> that they didn't call. Um, yeah. Part of a denture was later identified by Olive Duran Deacon's dentist at the trial. So dentures have like any anything that you you get like for a a part like like a pacemaker, a denture, an artificial limb, something like that. They have they have serial numbers on them, and so they're traceable. You know. Yeah. But I guess. Yeah. He didn't think about that because even back then, I mean, this is after Second World War, they're traceable. So he confesses. So they get him and they conf he confesses that he killed all of the McSwains, the Hendersons, as well as three other people, a young man called Max, a girl from Eastbourne and an unidentified woman from Hammersmith. But nobody could substantiate those claims. I I'm betting he probably did. Um, so his defense was one of insanity. He tried to claim insanity because he said he went insane drinking the blood of his victims. So, but there wasn't any evidence that he drank the blood. So they think it was just all a ruse. Yeah. Um, what a, yeah. oh, continue. Sorry. That kind of threw me off that what, I've been going, I, I, yeah, like I went crazy drinking the blood. Yeah, the um let's see, Sir Hart Hartley Shawcross, Lord Shawcross, led for the prosecution and urged the jury to reject his defense. They said um he wasn't insane because he acted with malice of um a forethought. So I mean he planned it all, right? Because he he forged documents. He was selling their property. It was all, it was all planned. This was not, it was all premeditated. Um, yeah. They called many witnesses to attest to Hayes' mental state, including Henry Yowley's, who claimed Hay had a paranoid constitution, adding the absolute callous, cheerful, bland, and almost friendly indifference of the accused to the crimes, which he freely admits having committed is unique in my experience. So. Um, so he, he believed that if the bodies of his victims could not be found, then he could not be convicted of murder. It, it took only 10 minutes for the jury to find him guilty. And they uh, sentenced him to death on, um, August 10th, 1949. They gave him a shot of brandy and then they hanged him. So. Wow. Yeah. Um, his guilt was not in question. There was, a, there was an editor of the Daily Mirror, which was kind of a weird, like, s side road here. This guy named Sylvester Bolum, um, had extensively covered this trial, the, the murders and the trial in his, in the newspaper. And he himself ended up being sentenced to a three-month prison term for contempt of court for describing Hay as a murderer while the trial will, trial was still underway. So there's no, remember, we have the Constitution. They don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there's really no freedom of speech over there. It's very, it's, 
they do and they don't. You can go astray very easily in England. So um, yeah, it's it's whatever is deemed as offensive, you know. So yeah, and that seems nebulous. So, but anyway, another gruesome murder and murders, m many murders. So, you know, uh, so we have where I live, right? We have a plant here that uses rail cars of sulfuric acid in their processes. So, uh, yeah. So I see this stuff on rail cars going by going, huh? Yeah, that's gruesome. Anyway, I know it's used for a bunch of stuff because I work in an in industry that I inspect a lot of stuff and yeah, it's, it's a little gruesome what can go on out there, but yeah. Look at SOS. I know. I'm telling you. My dad, when he, my dad said in LA County, there was a, a, a dog food canning operation. This was back a long time ago. And it was a great place for the mob to dispose of bodies. Because oh, yep. They could, yep. They uh, I know canning. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. They became yep. dog food. Yep. So, ugh. anyway, this was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was pretty pretty gruesome. Oh man, just to think, like he's sitting there dissolving mice, and then he's like, "Well, how would this transfer over like a person?" You know, and then like doing the math in his head. You know, oh man, it's it's crazy. I can't believe you people you listen to this stuff. You guys are sick. <laughs> I know, right? You're sick. You're sick. I tell you. Sick people. How dare you? Shame on you. <laughs> well. This was a short one, but it was a good one. Hope you liked it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So we are signing off. I am Decon, and this is... SOS. And remember, guys, to always look both ways, especially when you find yourself on Nightmare Road. Ah, <laughs> oh, gross. The acid. Yeah.